Hello, how's everybody doing? Um, I think we've got a few chairs in the front if some of the people standing wanna try and slip in before we get started. Um, thanks for joining me before lunch. I know last session in the morning can sometimes uh, drag on a little bit, so we're gonna try and uh, keep this party going uh, while we do some live setup of DevOps tools. Um, I gotta tell you, coming from a non-computer science background, a lot of what we're gonna be doing today when I started doing it for the first time was really scary. And the reason I like doing talks like this, first of all, uh, my degrees are in English and design, so if I can do this, you can do this. And second, when I work with customers, uh, I'm, I'm with Acquia Professional Services, I work with customers all the time, and I hear weekly, like I'm, I'm not joking, weekly, oh, we don't do local development because it's too hard. Or we don't do continuous integration because nobody on the team knows how to do it, and it's too hard. So we're gonna move quick today, but my, my goal with this session is to show you this is not hard. It, yeah, it may be a little scary, but get into it, try it out. I guarantee you, you can do it. Um, and with apologies, we are gonna move pretty quick today. So if you're trying to follow along, they're recording this session. I'm gonna post my code online on GitLab so you can see it later. I'm gonna post my slides. So if I leave you behind a little bit, I'm sorry. Come back, do it after. Hopefully you won't regret it. So, just to introduce myself real quick, if you don't know me, I'm Mike Madison. I'm a senior manager on Acquia's professional services team. Uh, I oversee our Drupal delivery in North America, so I see some familiar faces in the crowd, and uh, if we haven't met, hello, thanks for joining me. Uh, some contact info there uh, for me. Please do uh, hit me up sometime. Always interested in connecting. Today, Mostly, like I said, what I really wanna to do today is show you how easy it is to integrate these different technologies on your projects. So we are gonna start completely fresh. Uh, hopefully the Wi-Fi holds out. Uh, if it doesn't, I have some videos we can pull up, but that's, that's less fun. Uh, and my goal in 45 minutes or less is to set up a new project with Composer, uh, virtual environment. We're gonna use Lando today, but pick your poison. You can use whatever you want get Drupal installed, get a basic config strategy in place, get NPM wired into a custom theme, and get continuous integration going. That is doable in 45 minutes on a good day, so we'll, we'll see how far we get. Uh, and a couple of disclaimers I wanna give you. You're not gonna see me spend four hours setting up my computer as like a container factory. Uh, depending on wireless and on conference Wi-Fi, it probably would take several hours. I've already installed Xcode, I've already got Homebrew set up, so you know, Composer, Git, PHP, all that junk, it's already here, it's ready to go. So if you have a brand new computer, or if you have a computer that you haven't done some of this DevOps stuff on before, just be aware there are some prereqs to, to sort of get it ready to do some of what we're doing here today. Um, most of you I see are on Macs, uh, that's good. Um, you can do this stuff on a Windows machine, but it, it is harder and it, does take longer, so uh, if at all possible, I do recommend uh, trying to do it on a, uh, on a Mac. So again, this is sort of all of the stuff I've preloaded on my machine uh, that you're not gonna see happening on camera today, uh, so we can essentially just jump in and go. So, the very first thing that we're gonna do uh, is use Composer to set up a brand new project. Now, if you know me, typically I do this uh, using Acquia BLT. We're not gonna do BLT today. We're gonna start just with the most basic Drupal uh, recommended project. We're gonna call this live. Uh, one second. Not composer required, composer create project. And again, I'm doing this live, so I'm gonna make some mistakes and that's okay. There we go. So, um, as Composer downloads this for me and sets up a brand new project, um, it's gonna pull in whatever uh, dependencies are in that Drupal recommended project, which in this, in this case is uh, very, very minimal, and that's, that's, that's good. Uh, that's, that's what we want uh, in this case. I use PHP Storm as an IDE. Uh, that's not an advertisement for PHP Storm. I just think it's really good. Uh, you can use whatever you want, but if you're using, um, if you are doing work in Drupal 8, 9, 10, 
please do it in an IDE. They're not that scary, and uh, you will be very sad if you try to do this uh, with another code editor. Uh, IDEs really, really, really do make the world go round when it comes to uh, working uh, with Drupal 9. So the first thing you may notice here uh, is that my Drupal install is in a web folder. Now, uh, in the Acquia world, we prefer to put uh, Drupal in a folder called docroot. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. We're just gonna come into our composer file, come down to the Drupal scaffolding, and we're just gonna update the web root location. So instead of web, we're gonna change that to docroot. If you're not familiar with Composer scaffolding, it is legitimately one of my favorite parts of working with Composer. Um, every Composer package out there, Composer, uh, the Composer.json file basically has a type of thing. So is it Drupal core, is it a module, is it a theme, whatever. And the Composer scaffold lets me tell Composer where to put all that stuff. So if I add a new module to my uh, project, for instance, uh, Composer's automatically gonna say, okay, this is a type of Drupal module and I want you to put that in docroot modules contrib and then the name of the module. This is really important, we're gonna come back to that in a sec, but I'm gonna now come back and do a Composer update, um, which will essentially move all of my Drupal stuff out of this web directory. Uh, and dump it into a docroot directory, which is uh, where I want it. Don't let me down, Wi-Fi. All right, while that is running, I'm gonna open another project that has some of this stuff already done, just in case. We're also gonna go ahead and remove that web directory because we don't actually need it anymore. All right, while my composer is trying to run, I'm thinking about it, we're gonna do a couple other things. I'm gonna go ahead and set up get, and we're gonna create a get ignore file. One of the most common things I see when people are setting up composer and DevOps tools for the first time is they make the mistake that you're seeing right here, which is that this vendor directory is not get ignored. So I actually did some counting once, and if you have a Drupal 9 project with a modest number of modules, there's something like 40 to 50,000 files that Composer is gonna pull in for Drupal core, all your modules, and then all the dependency trees all the way down to the bottom. That's a lot of junk you don't need in your Git repository. Now, you need it to host Drupal, you need it to run Drupal, but Imagine every time you do a Composer update or a Drupal core update, you're trying to track version control across 50,000 files. Like that's nuts, like there's no, like that makes your Git history just worthless. So one of the first things I always do on a brand new project is I'll actually go in and Git ignore everything um, that Composer is doing for me. That way, I don't have to worry about committing anything other than the composer.json and the composer.lock file. If you don't have a lot of experience with Composer, we're not gonna go super deep into any of these technologies today. There have been some really fantastic Composer presentations at previous Drupal cons. Go check those out. Um, but TLDR, you don't want all of the Composer uh, managed stuff to get committed into Git. So you'll notice we're dropping vendor, docroot core. Remember how I was telling you how these paths are really important? Well, we just get ignored all of those paths, right? So docroot modules contrib, any of the contributed modules, any of the contributed themes, again, all that stuff is being managed by Composer. We don't want it committed into Git. Cool. We're also going to add a couple of additional Composer packages. So if you're not familiar with the Composer patches uh, plugin, it is a must have in my opinion, Drush is a must have. If you're not hosting with Acquia, you probably don't want our environment detector, but you should have something similar. Um, because remember when you're hosting in the cloud, you're gonna have one set of database credentials for each environment. When you're working locally, you don't want your production database credentials local. When you're doing CI, you don't want your local credentials in your CI. So an environment detector is there to help your code figure out where you are and based on where you are, which credentials to use. So I'm using Acquia's today. Um, you do not have to use ours, as I said. So Composer require 
Drush, Drush, and Aquia, Drupal, and nope. Uh, yeah, Drupal. Environment Detector. Excellent. And again, since I've already updated my gitignore, you can see now PHP Storm is showing vendor as green um, or yellow or whatever color we want to call that. And all of those additional uh, dependencies are automatically going to go into the vendor directory. Cool. All right, let's move on from setting up that new project. We've already initialized and gotten Git set up. Uh, I am going to add a Git remote. Um, don't worry about trying to write this URL down. I've already tweeted it, uh, so you can get to it there, and I will flash my Twitter again at the end. Uh, it's just Mike Madison on Twitter, so you can get to it easily. And again, this is a public-facing repo, so you can get to it. All right, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get a local environment set up. Now again, as I said earlier, I'm gonna set up using Lando. Um, DDEV, Doxel, if you're not using an M1 Mac, uh, Drupal VM still works. Like, pick your poison, any container's fine. Uh, I'm gonna use Lando. So, um, to do that, I need to modify and create a few files. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna copy default settings.php and turn this into a uh, settings.php file. Of course, PHP Storm is still indexing, so it's not gonna let me copy the file, that's okay. Cool, we'll come back to that in just a sec. We're also going to create a .lando.yaml file Now you might wonder why am I using a container as opposed to just running this on like my computer's web server. Two reasons. Number one, it's way faster to set up a container using Lando or DDEV than it is for me to run all the crap to get my Mac to actually run a web server. And second, I can actually commit this Lando.yaml file into my repository. So if all of you want to work with me, I can set this up once, you can pull down the file, Lando start, and you're up and running, ready to go. So it, it actually makes collaboration a ton easier using any of these containerization tools that, that let you commit this file. And again, Doxel, DDEV, Lando, Drupal VM, they all, they all give you that. So sure, it is an extra thing that you have to run on top of your bare computer, but without this, every one of you would have to set up your own web server. There's a chance you're gonna do it differently than me. Uh, if you're running Windows and somebody over there is running Linux and I'm running Mac, yeah, that doesn't matter, right? Lando's Lando's Lando. It's gonna work, it's gonna be the same. So, pretty cool. Uh, I'm using just the Drupal 9 recipe because, again, we're going for super basic here today. I am running PHP 8. Uh, I am telling Lando that my web root is in doc root, and I honestly don't remember if xdebug is on or not by default in this recipe, and I'm turning it off because I don't want to wait for it to do anything extra today. And we will just get that started provisioning in the background. While it's doing so, uh, we're gonna make a quick tweak to this settings file. So remember, we, we added our Acquia Drupal uh, environment detector uh, so we're gonna add a use statement into the settings.php so I can actually use that plugin. And I'm just gonna pull in a quick code snippet because it's faster than typing it out. This is just saying uh, there is a is local um, environment method inside this environment detector. And if we are local, uh, I haven't actually created this config split yet, but bear with me, we'll get there. Uh, I'm telling Drupal to use this database stuff, uh, which is the default database settings uh, for Lando. Cool, and again, I've uh, obviously uh, provisioned this a few times, it's all cached, but I now have a local uh, DevOps Lando site. I'm gonna run Lando Drush site install, minimal with no interaction. And based on that change I just made into the settings.php file, you can see we're talking to the Drupal 9 database already. That's good. And this is gonna finish up here in just a matter of seconds. So that's from absolutely nothing to a bootstrap Drupal in uh, 14 minutes, that's not, that's not terrible on conference Wi-Fi. 
Um, but this is a pretty terrible looking Drupal site. Um, I'm not sure any of your customers or uh, your own uh, company would pay much money for this, so we, we need to do a little bit more with it. So let's get logged in and do a little bit of configuration magic to at least make this look less terrible. I don't know if you've uh, set up minimal without Claro or anything re uh, recently, but uh, yeah, that's, that's not, not awesome. All right, we're gonna add a couple of additional Drupal modules just to make life easier. Just for fun, let's go in and actually enable a real theme that doesn't look absolutely terrible. So we're gonna go ahead and set Olivero as our default. That's much better. And then we'll also install Claro, wherever it is. And set that to be the admin theme, hooray. And then we'll go in and turn on just a handful of modules to make this a actually reasonably functional Drupal site. While well, that's spinning, super common thing that happens right about now, which is kind of annoying, um, which is why I'm telling you about it, because it annoys me, is that uh, when you install Drupal uh, for the very first time, sometimes it will attempt to overwrite and change your settings.php file without you realizing it. And uh, PHP Storm is likely still indexing, so, uh, we may just suddenly have another database array here. So if you ever are going through these steps and it works, and then all of a sudden you can't communicate with your database anymore, go look in your settings.php file. Drupal may have tried to helpfully um, uh, write your database array for you, uh, which in this case is not super helpful. We're also going to reset um, the permissions of the default directory, which again, Drupal will sometimes reset, which is a great security measure on an actual web server, but kind of a pain in the butt locally. You notice, you may notice I'm setting my config sync directory here to be outside the doc root uh, into config default. Uh, Drupal will try to store all of your site config in the files directory, uh, which is wildly insecure. Uh, so you should always change that to put it outside the doc root just to be sure it's never web accessible. And now I'm gonna do just a uh, drush config export, which will spit out all of the config from this project. And if all went well, it should have created a config default directory for me. Like I said, sometimes PHP Storm and its indexing is a little slow and it may not be seeing everything here. Yeah, and slash app slash config is inside the Lando container. So uh, that is actually right here, uh, or it should be. All right, so let's move on while we let PHP Storm continue doing what it's doing. I feel like I'm a couple of slides behind. Yep, we've done that. And we're gonna move on to CI CD here in just a sec. 
what we need to do is try to force PHP Storm to edit this file, which it is struggling, I think, to do. Remember, it's, it's a little deceptive what we're doing here, but this uh, project that we're using has thrown something like 50,000 files into this uh, directory. So it does, believe it or not, struggle a little bit sometimes uh, to keep up with that, um, that outpouring of stuff. So let's try a config export one more time and then we're gonna move on. App config default, yeah, and it is not mounting into this right now. That's exciting, cool. If we have time, we'll come back and look at that more seriously, but this should have stored it. Uh, there should be a config default directory right here where that is being written, cool. Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about where we go from here. Now, normally I would be reinstalling from config, uh, and again, it's a little odd that my config is not where I want it to be. Uh, let's do nano doc root sites default settings.php. Let's see if it actually did write it. It did. It's the right version of the file. Cool, neat. All right, well, it wouldn't be a live demo if something didn't go wrong. <laughs> All right, we're gonna just create a GitLab file and talk about this real quick. Mm, actually, no, before we move on to that, let's create a theme and talk about NPM real quick. So we're gonna create a new theme called DevOps. Now you might wonder why are we talking about um, NPM on a Drupal project? Um, remember that themes, much like other Drupal code, have best practices for how you develop and build those tools. Um, and it's very commonly overlooked, especially if you have a PHP background to go, oh, we don't need to worry about that, it's just CSS. Well, yeah, I mean, it is just CSS, but you should still be writing good CSS. So if you're pulling NPM and Gulp and some of those best-in-class front-end tools into your theme, you can start doing things like JavaScript linting, SAS or CSS linting, you can minify your CSS and JavaScript automatically as part of your build process, et cetera. We're not gonna go all the way down that rabbit hole today, uh, but I do just wanna show you how easy it is to tie that into this process along with Composer uh, and everything else. So we're just gonna create a basic theme that is a base theme of stable, uh, and we're not gonna do really anything else um, to it right this second. We'll run npm init, just do all the default stuff because uh, we're not actually gonna use this for anything, and we'll do npm install gulp just for, just for fun. And again, if there's an actual front-end person in the room, you may have opinions about uh, Webpack versus Gulp. You can do it the same way. You might want to use Yarn instead of NPM. Same way, doesn't matter. Super easy uh, to swap those things over. The point is, what you want to end up with is a um, package.json and package, uh, package.lock file. Um, and you'll notice, I didn't explicitly call it out earlier, but I did in my git ignore get ignore node modules, uh, and it's the same reason, right? For the exact same reason, you don't wanna commit your composer vendor folder, uh, you don't wanna commit your node modules. Also, most of the tools that we're talking about using here for front-end theming stuff are for development, so you don't necessarily need or want them out on your production website anyway. So by get ignoring these, they'll be there locally, they'll be there during your CI, CD process, and then they won't be there when you deploy out to the cloud, which again, typically, typically is a good thing. All right, so we've got NPM in place. We're gonna come back to the GitLab CI in just a sec. Let's talk about how to actually start um, using some of this stuff. Now, as I said before, typically I use BLT, Acquia's build and launch tools. It has automation built in for a lot of what we're talking about. Since we're doing this without BLT, um, I'm actually gonna use Composer 
uh, to help me drive some of this stuff. So I'm just gonna grab this snippet and then we'll talk, we'll talk through it. So Composer allows you to, to define scripts as part of your composer.json file. So for instance, I could, every time I did an install, uh, manually run drush site install, existing config, whatever, you know, whatever other options you want to pass in. Or I can write a little composer script called site install, and then instead of running drush site install, blah, 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 I can just run composer site install or lando composer install, and it'll run this command. Uh, similarly, I can do a post command. So in this case, I'm doing a uh, post install command, which means whenever I run composer install, composer will then go into my theme and run npm install. Um, so again, these little things you can automate uh, and script so that they happen the same way every time, uh, well worth the energy. Uh, and we will see this at play in our um, GitLab uh, build process here in just a moment. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, rename this file and actually make it the right name because GitLab isn't gonna cut it. It needs to be .gitlabci.yaml. Uh, and I have just a basic, very basic build here. Uh, and you may look at this and go, Mike, that's like 30 lines. That's not super basic, but like, let's, let's talk about this for a second. So I'm pulling in an image. Uh, this is actually a Lando image. So believe it or not, I'm using the exact same image in my CI that I'm using locally in Lando. It's not a bad thing. I have one step, it's a build step. I've defined a couple of variables for my MySQL stuff that I'm doing down here. You don't, strictly speaking, have to do that. And then we get into the build. So this is stage build. Uh, we don't allow failure. Um, failure is sometimes an option, but not during CI. Uh, services, we do need a MySQL service, because if you don't have a database, you're not gonna run Drupal. Um, I am very manually creating, like this is about as manual as you can get, a Drupal database in which to install Drupal. We'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, I'm installing Node.js. Again, this is a, a few different steps to do that, and that's okay. And then I'm running a couple of composer commands. So composer validate, uh, this just guarantees that the composer.json and the composer.lock file that I've committed are valid. Um, essentially that will cause the build to fail early if they're not. I'm running a composer install, which remember, we get for free now an npm install with that because of our post install command, cool. And then we're using two different composer commands that I defined for this project. We're doing composer site install, which will run drush site install minimal existing config, uh, yes. And then uh, site update, which is a drush updb, uh, and then a couple of config imports, uh, which in this case are probably superfluous since we're installing from existing config, but that's okay. Now, before we actually jump out to GitLab and look at what this build process looks like, um, let's talk about this for a sec. So you'll notice that I'm creating a database called Drupal. And when we looked at my settings.php file a little while ago, um, I had a bunch of database credentials called Drupal 9. So this, this isn't gonna work, right? And it shouldn't. Like I, I can't stress enough that this should not work in GitLab because these are my local credentials for my database. So I'm gonna go back to my uh, pre-formatted file here just to grab the example so I don't have to um, manually type it all out. GitLab has an environment variable and you can find this in their documentation or any other build system has similar environment variables. So basically I'm just checking to see if there's a GitLab CI environment variable, then I'm gonna have a completely different database array for GitLab. And again, depending on how you host, where you host, some hosting providers have a single include line that just pulls in all their junk. You may have a, a, a whole big long database array like this that you know switches between. But the point is you're, you're probably gonna need to start managing upwards of at least three different sets of credentials, right? You're gonna have your cloud credentials for hosting, you're gonna have your local credentials for development, and then you're gonna have your CI credentials. 
whether you have an environment detector like the Acquia one or you have um, environment variables, it doesn't really matter. Again, as long as you know for sure, you can say, right now I am in dev, right now I am in CI. You just don't want to start crossing uh, database credentials uh, for, for hopefully obvious reasons. Uh, and again, we're not doing anything with config splits right this second, but I did just want to show an example here of how, you know, again, we typically would set up environment-based splits uh, as part of configuration management. So, you know, if I'm local, I'm going to want like my DB log module on. I'm probably going to want to turn syslog off. I want all my UI modules turned on. Um, it may very well be in the CI environment that uh, we have some other stuff that we want to turn on for testing, so on and so forth. Take advantage of this if statement, right? Like once we know we're in CI, once we know we're in local, there's no reason not to do some of that other stuff uh, sort of in line in the same place. So uh, we're going to jump over to a uh, example repo. Um, this is all of this stuff. Um, you can see in the repo already, I basically have an initial commit that is just a doc root. Notice there is no vendor. If you clone this repo down, which you're welcome to do, as soon as you run composer install, you're going to have the vendor folder, right? It's just not committed as we talked about earlier. I do have a merge request open right now, um, which we will have a look at here. And that merge request actually is running um, a CICID or a CICD build based on uh, this file um, that I showed you a moment ago. It's thinking. Uh, and what we can see in that CI CD build, once it's, it's there, is essentially this step, right? We're going to see the output of composer validate, the output of composer install, npm install, site install, site update. Etc. And you can essentially go through and see. Now, we're, we're not going to do this today because we, we, we're running out of time. But the next steps from here, uh, and again, I'll show you these steps if, if this ever loads. Um, the next steps from here are to start thinking about what other types of validation and automated testing do you want to happen during CI. So are you using PHP unit, Nightwatch, BHAT? Uh, are you doing any visual regression testing, whatever? Uh, and again, the conversation I always have with people is automated testing isn't that hard as long as you have some place to run it. Well, here you go. This is, this is some place to run it. So once you have this basic piece in place, um, the next logical step is to start building on top of that. Remember, the ultimate goal with any DevOps setup like this is that every time you make a code change, whether that's a Drupal security update, a feature update, a bug fix, whatever, you want to go from a known working state, layer your new stuff on top of it, and see if it still works. Right? So that's why we install Drupal as part of CI. Because if we know Drupal installs today, and Drupal 9.4 comes out whenever it comes out, and I run that update through CI, and all of a sudden my CI fails and Drupal won't install, there's a pretty good sign that something from 9.3 whatever working to 9.4 whatever not working, something, there's a problem. Right? So we have a safety net from CI for that. The more robust you can make your continuous integration, the, the better your safety net. We may not get to see the build output, but if you go check out the uh, GitLab, hey, there we go. Uh, it's there. You can see we do have a passing build. Um, in this case, you can see I've got uh, uh, quite a few files uh, because, again, we're, um, I'm adding config, I'm adding the theme, all that stuff here in this merge request. Uh, and I'm going to just try to pull up continuous integration at this point um, so we can check that out. But again, you're, you're welcome to have a look here. Again, this is a public-facing GitLab. You can get into all of this and see it after the talk. And we'll come back to that in a sec when it's done spinning. So uh, again, next steps, thinking about coding standards, thinking about automated testing, accessibility testing, visual regression testing. This is the baseline to get all of those things started. And uh, again, most of the time when I start talking to you know, organizations about, well, why aren't you doing any automated testing? Well, we don't have any way to run it. Okay, that's fine, cool. Get something like this in place and then you can start building uh, on top of it. The other thing you wanna think about is um, a lot of what we've talked about here and what we're thinking about here are 
more the CI piece than the CD, right? Continuous integration as opposed to deployment. Um, in an ideal world, uh, you would actually use the same process, the same pipeline to actually then deploy out into your hosting environment. So uh, my very, 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 very basic uh, build is probably not sufficient for that because it doesn't have a deploy step, um, but you can see how to build on top of it from here uh, to get there. Um, keep in mind that you know, I happen to be using GitLab as an example here, but most hosting providers have a preferred uh, build system pipelines tool or whatnot. So I don't want you to walk away from here thinking, oh, we have to use GitLab, we have to use GitLab pipelines. Like, everybody has this. Um, the important thing is that you have it. So find the right Git for your organization, find the right continuous integration tool for your organization, and use that. Um, the syntax will be a little different than my example, but uh, not, not significantly. All right, we'll get this loading, and maybe, by the time we get to the end of the talk, uh, we can look at the build. So yeah, just a reminder, at the end of the day, I don't really care what you use to accomplish what we're looking at here. Um, we could have done this with GitHub Actions, or yeah, GitHub Actions, we could have done it with Travis CI, we could have done it with Acquia Pipelines, any, any number of different options. Um, just get something in place. And you also can start very simple, right? Having a build that installs Drupal, installs Composer, and then installs Drupal is better than nothing. There's immense value in confirming that your code base can install Drupal. You'd be surprised how many people I've worked with that their way of testing if they broke anything is deploying out to their dev environment. I mean, yeah, that, that'll tell you real quick if it works or not, but then you have to go unbreak dev if you broke dev. Break CI, CI's cheap. Um, break, break that first. All right, here is our build step. Well, that's finishing up. Uh, I'm gonna be doing some more talking about DevOps at the Acquia booth in a little bit. What you're seeing here is like gitlab.com, GitLab. Um, Acquia has a brand new proprietary GitLab uh, implementation called Acquia Code Studio that we haven't really touched on here. I'm gonna be doing a live demo of that at the Acquia booth during lunch. So uh, if you're free in about an hour, I hope you swing by to have a look at that. Uh, and I'm also gonna be talking at the booth tomorrow about Drupal 10 readiness. So if you're already running a Drupal 8 or Drupal 9 site, you're thinking about Drupal 10, uh, swing by. If nothing else, grab a Voodoo Donut and say hello. Um, I'm not gonna make this load uh, and make you wait. Uh, I wanna make sure we have time to answer your questions. So uh, thanks for coming. What questions do you have today? Yeah. So the, the question is, uh, do I ever keep the build artifact for diagnosing or, or things like that? Um, so I do tend to keep it. I very rarely use it. Um, just because th hopefully, theoretically, everything you're doing locally is gonna be the same as your CI. Everything you're doing locally in CI should be the same as what you deploy out. So if something fails in CI, I'm gonna go back to my pull request locally, reinstall or resync or do whatever, reproduce it there, fix it, and then push it back up. But yeah, I mean, if you can um, do a, like a soft commit or a soft deploy of that artifact someplace so you can hang on to it, that would be great. Uh, and if you have a hosting provider that lets you like spin up ephemeral environments as part of builds and, and deploy there, uh, that's really cool. And, yeah, there's, there's immense value in that if you have that option. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, what, what are the recommendations for doing continuous deployment? So for me, uh, because I'm, I'm pretty paranoid, um, I don't ever do a deployment unless I know my normal build passes. So typically the way I wire up my builds is I do a, a CI pass on a pull request or a merge request. When that gets merged, I run a whole nother build on the integration, and assuming that passes, I'll do a commit into a branch, 
And I will typically auto deploy that branch into a development environment. I like doing tagged based deployments into staging and prod. Um, you, you know, I know people who will put branches for stage and prod and when they're ready to go to stage, they'll do a whole nother build into like their staging branch and deploy there. That's an option, but I, I really like the simplicity of I'm gonna deploy whatever to dev, and when I'm ready, I'm gonna take that thing and cut a tag right there and push that tag to staging. That way, there's absolutely no chance that what's going to stage is different. Um, I like having that certainty that you know it's, it's exactly the same. But yeah, I mean, the, the big thing is just make sure that prod is a tagged release. You should, you should never, ever, ever push directly to prod on a branch and auto deploy, like always tag a prod release before you do it. Uh, so the question is, what about merging into like your, your primary integration branch? I mean, the workflows there are gonna be a little different depending on what kind of get workflow you're doing. Um, you know, I, unless, once I'm in production, then, then, you know, having separate like main and develop branches, I think are, are quite useful. But yeah, typically I would do a pull request into an integration branch, develop main, names don't really matter, right? Um, and then I would also have another uh, commit that happens to push out into the, the hosting environment. Um, the only real downside you would have to that, uh, and I, sorry, the question was uh, marking the vendor directory so it doesn't get indexed all the time. Um, similar, you can do things with like Drupal VM and Lando to stop NFS from constantly re-indexing and trying to sync large quantities of files so uh, you don't have what happened to me happen to you. The downside to doing that is if you do like a composer update or if you redraw your dependencies and end up with a lot of changes in that folder, then you have to remember to do that indexing manually. So um, if you're a developer who has somebody else who's doing those things for you, um, I would say the danger is higher that you could actually somehow get out of sync with like your dependencies. If you're the person who's doing those changes and uh, updates yourself, you're always gonna know when it happens, so it's a little easier for you to keep track of. I typically don't do that, and I typically don't have a problem other than this initial setup when it's like, oh God, there's 50,000 new files. You know, Other than that, it's usually not a problem. But I know many people who do some variation of stop, stopping that indexing for performance reasons. Yeah, so the question is, if you're working with an outside vendor, kind of what do we think about to get started? So Acquia's professional services team is, is not an agency, but we operate kind of like an agency inside of Acquia. So we have a standard way we like to work with a standard set of tools that we like to work with. So when we, when we start working with a new partner, with a new customer, you know, if somebody has a strong opinion, we use Lando here, or we use DDEV here, whatever, cool, fine, we'll work with that. If, we, if we're going in with somebody who doesn't have a strong opinion, uh, we usually say, cool, we're gonna build this our way and then you're welcome to continue doing that or not. So I think, you know, my advice is whether you're more on the agency like provider side or you're more of a, you know, an end user who owns an application, like think about what is the best thing for you. And you may work with somebody who has a super strong opinion, right? If you work with a development team or you bring in a new partner and they have a way they normally work, um, there, there's a non-zero cost associated to, to making somebody change their workflow. So usually what we try to figure out is like, is this a hill we wanna die on that we're gonna use GitHub Actions on this project instead of Acquia Pipelines? No, I don't care, cool, we'll use GitHub, right? It's fine. Um, oh yeah, you wanna use the bare web server on your MacBook instead of Lando? No, sorry, we're using Lando. You're like, you do you, we're gonna use Lando. You know, so I, I try to pick my battles respectfully there. Um, because like I've said a couple of times during this talk, a lot of what we're talking about in this sort of DevOpsy world, it matters that you do it, it matters less what you use to do it. And I think 
the notion of figuring out what works for you, what you're familiar with, there is immense time saving. There's immense benefits in training and onboarding. If you have a standard set of tools, a standard set of documentation, you know, if you work at an organization, an agency, whatever, that, that does a lot of different like revolving door sorts of projects, right? I'm gonna switch from this to that and that to this. If you're using six different tech stacks across six different projects, that's hard. If you're using one, maybe two different tech stacks across six projects, it's a lot easier to flip between those and, and you know, know, hey, because I'm doing this thing over here, it's gonna work exactly the same way over there. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the question is any recommendation for database uh, use in CI? Um, my fervent opinion is that you should never, ever, ever, ever do anything with a database in CI. So if you're writing tests, if you're doing something in CI, you, just, you should assume it doesn't exist and create it as part of the build. And, and the reason for that, uh, and, and not everybody at Acquia will agree with you, I don't know that everybody in the, the room will agree with me on this, but um, like I said, we wanna go from a known working state and make one change or as small of a change as possible to see where we're at. If we're relying on a database as well, I, I've seen this many times where you open a pull request and it fails. So the assumption is, oh, I screwed something up in my merge request, and then I go down this rabbit hole trying to debug or chase down the problem. And then as it turns out, the reason the build fails is because somebody deleted a piece of content in production and it's not in the database anymore. And hopefully you figure that out like in a matter of minutes, not hours or days, right? Um, if you design your builds so that the CI process creates the content that it needs, I use the default content module a lot if you're not familiar with that. Um, you know, we talked about having a config split for the CI environment. If you have a module that has content in it that you need and you turn it on as part of your config split for CI, that's another trick to getting your content there without relying on a database. Anyway, if you create the content as part of the build, you know it's always gonna be there. If you delete the content as part of the build, you know it's gonna go away. There's no question of relying on an external database, which again gets you back to the state of knowing 100%. If it stops working, it's something inside that pull request that broke it. Yeah, so if it, he's asking if, it, uh, if it's a config-related change instead of a content change. Again, I store all of my config on disk. I always do a drush config export as part of uh, builds. I do a drush config import. As part of deploys, I do a drush config import. So again, anything that I need or want on my site, I'm putting it there as part of the build. So that's why Composer runs during the build. That's why NPM runs. That's why drush site install, config import, all of that stuff happens in the build. And it really forces you in that case, like if I'm doing site building, right, if I go add a view to my site, I have to export that config from wherever I built my view, I have to commit it into my repo, and then I have to make sure that both my CI and my deployment process will ingest that config somehow to get it out, whether that's, you know, doing a hook update in or a config import or whatever, you know, again, it's, it's forcing me to sort of track that change just like I would a PHP change. Good questions. Uh, I want to be respectful of lunch. I think we're at time. Um, I'm happy to keep chatting. So if you have questions, uh, keep them coming, but I don't want to keep the whole room hostage. So I appreciate you guys coming, uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.